Good morning. We have general questions. Question one in the name of uh, Paul Martin, it's not lodged. The member has provided an explanation. Question two, George Adam. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the recent fan zone at Simon Park will have on its policy in banning alcohol at football matches. Minister Jamie Hepburn. I understand the fan zone set up at the match between St Mirren and Motherwell was located out with the restricted areas as covered by alcohol at football grounds legislation. We have no plans to remove the existing restrictions on alcohol at football grounds. George Adam. I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister would be aware that some unfans own adults were allowed to consume alcohol at the ground before the game. This passed without incident and, and encouraged a family event with various sections within the zone, including a play area for younger people. This is enjoyed by most of the fans, including myself and my wife Stacey. Would the Minister support St Mun being used as a pilot club as a way to examine alcohol being reintroduced at football stadiums on match day? Minister. Well, can I say to uh, Mr Aram, sure he enjoyed... Uh, and Stacey enjoyed that experience more than the last time our teams met when Partick Thistle won 1-0. And I thought that was important to place on the record, President Officer. But in relation to the uh, specific uh, matter at hand, decisions on this matter uh, are informed by Police Scotland, which confirmed that it is not at this stage minded to seek a relaxation of the controls and alcohol being sold within uh, the stadium at football matches, but is engaging uh, with interested parties in reviewing the matter. As a member of the SPFL, St Mirren Football Club is one of those interested parties which would be part of any review. Hugh Henry. Thank you. I think George Adam makes an eminently sensible suggestion. I can't understand, presiding officer, why the minister won't look at a pilot project that actually encourages football fans to be treated as responsible adults in the same way that rugby fans are. Minister. Well, of course, we'll uh, always be willing to consider any particular proposition that's put before us, but the position remains that we are informed in these matters by Police Scotland and they have confirmed at this stage that they are not, not minded to seek a relaxation of the existing controls. Question three, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will review the impact of employment tribunal fees prior to the proposed devolution. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, the Scottish Government is concerned that the current fee system unfairly impedes access to justice and in preparing for any new devolved responsibilities, we will want to review the impact they might have. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that answer. Figures obtained by the Herald reveal a 68% fall in Scottish cases, a fall of almost 5,000 in the nine months since the fees were introduced. Can you... Does the Minister agree... Excuse me, Mr Gibson. Can you... That's it. Thank Does you. the Minister agree with the Law Society of Scotland that the impact of such fees has been catastrophic for claimants and that such fees are basically a charter for rogue employers? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, the member might uh, uh, be interested to know that Fergus Ewing, the Minister for Business, Energy and Tourism, uh, wrote to Joe Swinson MP on 24th June 2013 outlining this government's opposition to these fees. Uh, and he highlighted then that for many people, fees will represent an unaffordable risk regardless of the strength of the case. Uh, there is now a mounting body of evidence highlighting sharp falls in the numbers bringing cases to employment tribunals uh, and the Law Society's statement is clearly based on that evidence. For the information of the Chamber, uh, we do know that uh, there has been a reduction in total cases uh, of 65% in Scotland when comparing the three-month period January-March 2014 with the same period in 2013. For that same period, sex discrimination cases in Scotland fell by 84.6%. Race discrimination cases fell by 50% and disability discrimination cases fell by 47.3%. And those figures tell us that there's a great many people out there now unable to access the justice that they should be entitled to receive. Question four, James Dornan. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met representatives of COSLA and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. The Scottish Government meets frequently with representatives of COSLA to discuss shared policy interests. In addition, the Minister for Local Government and Community Empowerment and I make COSLA, meet COSLA on a bi-monthly basis to discuss issues of mutual concern. James Dornan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. We know that the political posturing over leaving COSLA has seen civil war break out between Labour councils. Two of the councils have U-turned on an initial decision to leave COSLA, with Western Bartonshire saying we want to remain part of the organisation which provides a national voice for local government in Scotland. Unfortunately, Glasgow has still not changed its mind about leaving. Could the Cabinet Secretary tell me what he considers could be the impact on the people of Glasgow if this Labour Council choose not to follow Inverclyde and Western Bartonshire in reconsidering their original decision to leave COSLA? 
The presiding officer, membership of COSLA is a matter for individual councils, and all councils at the moment remain members of COSLA at the present time, and we continue to discuss shared policy interests with COSLA. I would not dare interfere in internal matters. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister if the Scottish Government will consult with the local authority members and non-members of COSLA on an equal basis regarding national policy. Cabinet Secretary. Sorry, Cam yeah, I, I absolutely. We are more than happy to discuss all of these matters in a, a very inclusive manner, as always. Question number five, Hugh Henry. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to protect people who serve the public from abuse or violence at work. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. All workers, including those who serve the public, deserve protection from abuse and violence. That is why Scotland's justice system provides for protection for all workers under our common laws of assault, uh, threatening and abusive behaviour and breach of the peace. We fully support our police prosecutors and courts in dealing robustly with people who offend against public facing workers. And in addition, the Scottish Government provides financial support to the Scottish Business Resilience Centre who work with employers to help put in place measures to help keep members of staff safe from abuse and violence while at work. And the Regulatory Reform Act 2014 also introduced additional provisions to extend protection to SEPA officers in the conduct of their duties. Hugh Henry. I thank you, President Officer. Uh, warm words, but no commitment to actually do anything from the Minister. Also, some indication of double standards. Can the Minister tell us why the Scottish Government believes, quite rightly, that uh, emergency workers need specific uh, protection? Why the Solicitor General believes that victims of domestic abuse need specific protection, but that workers who are assaulted at work do not need specific protection? Minister. Um, well, I, I just outlined in my original answer, presiding officer, to the member that we've taken action in the 2014 Regulator Reform Act to protect uh, front, uh, frontline workers in, from SEPA. So the point that was made about us not taking action and just having warm words is, is entirely false. Uh, but I would also say that we, we do recognise uh, the issue that the, the member raised about emergency workers. Uh, we support the views offered by the Crown Office about the difference between emergency workers and public facing workers. The Lord Advocate Colin Boyd uh, QC at the time of the Emergency Workers Act took part in the parliamentary debates in relation to the Emergency Workers Scotland Bill in 20, 2004 and said the following, it's completely unacceptable that anyone should be the subject of assault or abuse at work. We want to make sure that the law is an effective tool in ensuring the safety and welfare of emergency workers and all public service workers. We are prudent to recognise the legislation is not the answer in every case. In some situations, the best possible solutions lie within existing law. And I'm firmly of view that this uh, is true for the protection of public service workers. So we do take the issue seriously, but existing laws can be enforced uh, on, uh, as I said earlier, in terms of the offences of assault, offensive behaviour and breach of the peace. And that's what we intend to do. Question number six, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to assist business start-ups. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. So the Scottish Government is committed to providing the economic environment to enable businesses to start up and thrive. Support ranges from our competitive business rates package, advice and assistance for entrepreneurship and innovation, delivered through our enterprise agencies, the Business Gateway and through other channels, investment and in infrastructure and international assistance. The latest official statistics published by ONS in November 2014 showed that there were 21,540 new business registrations in Scotland in 2013, which was an increase from 17,385 in 2012. This represents a 23.9 per cent increase over the last year, taking the business birth rate to a record high. Jenny Mara. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. I saw his press release heralding this progress. However, um, the main cities in Scotland show a bit of disparity. Um, Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Glasgow are consistently in the top five for business start-ups, but my home city of Dundee languishes in the bottom third of this table consistently for business start-up. What will the Cabinet Secretary do to put additional support into Dundee to encourage economic growth? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I don't know why Jenny Mara is so desperate to consistently talk down achievements in the city of Dundee. In the city of Dundee, there was a 28.8% increase in business startups between 2012 and 2013. Um, that was a higher increase in the business birth rate than for the whole of Scotland, which was 23.9%, as I've just said to Parliament. So I really, it is beyond me why Jenny Mara is so determined 
question by question to talk down the achievements of the City of Dundee, which is actually delivering a faster increase in the business birth rate than the rest of Scotland. Now, of course, the Government is committed through all of the interventions we take, through the, the, the delivery of our uh, enterprise agency support throughout Scotland, through the work of the Business Gateway, which is undertaken, through the support. I've just this morning been at the launch of the uh, some new initiatives with the Prince's Trust who deploy support to new business startups, the length and breadth of Scotland, including in the city of Dundee. Uh, all of these uh, are measures the government will support, and our can do entrepreneurship framework is uh, attracting international attention as a successful strategy in encouraging business, uh, the birth, business birth rate improvement. And I do hope it attracts some support from Jenny Mara in the period to come. Under Fabiani. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me on the importance of small businesses to all our local communities? Uh, does he therefore think that anyone wishing to start a new business should be given every support from both national and local government? And does he further agree that this is an element of the work of the East Cobride Task Force, which should be treated very seriously? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, yes, and, and for, for the reasons that uh, Linda Fabiani has outlined, the government has prioritise support for small business through the maintenance of the most competitive approach to small business taxation in the United Kingdom through the Small Business Bonus Scheme. In addition to that, uh, the Government works very closely with uh, Business Gateway, ensuring that uh, companies at a local level in all localities can have access to the support of the enterprise network. And I know that in East Kilbride, where there have been economic challenges that have to be addressed by the um, the East Kilbride Task Force, that uh, I, I certainly hope that this will be given the due priority at local level to ensure that every business development opportunity that can be taken forward in what has been uh, a, a, an essential part of the business growth environment in Scotland and East Kilbride over many years um, is continued in the future. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that many personal licence holders in the licence trade have not had their personal licences renewed recently. This is inhibiting small businesses and perhaps business start-ups. Can the Cabinet Secretary, in conjunction with his colleague Paul Wheelhouse, seek a change in the legislation which is currently denying individuals their right to work in existing and new businesses? This is a huge problem. Cabinet Secretary. I, I, if Mr Scott will forgive me, I will explore in some detail the issues that he has raised today. And if he would care to write to me about that, I will certainly ensure that it is um, it's given strong exploration. My colleague, Mr Wheelhouse, is in Parliament and will have heard the comments that have been made about the licensing system. Uh, we will certainly explore as to whether there is anything within the responsibility of the Government that uh, can be taken forward. Obviously, licensing decisions are invariably taken by uh, local authority level through licensing boards. But we will explore the issues that Mr Scott has raised with me today. Question number seven, Angus MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding the Committee on Toxicities investigation into the use of organophosphate products by farmers and crofters in the 1980s and 90s. Minister Maureen Watt. <coughs> As background, the Committee on Toxicity published a statement on organophosphates on 13 March 2014. This followed a comprehensive systematic review of peer-reviewed research on exposure to organophosphates that was published up to September 2013. It concluded that exposure to this chemical do not cause significant long-term neurological toxicity in adults. This review took account of, ex of extensive peer-reviewed journals on the use of and exposure to organophosphates by those in the agricultural sector. It would appear that independent scientific evidence over many years, including the latest independent statement published this year, has identified no risk to human health from the appropriate use of organophosphates in sheep dip. To date, the Scottish Government has not had discussions with the UK Government. However, I would be willing to raise this issue with my counterpart in the UK Government if substantive new evidence emerges. Angus MacDonald. I, I note the Minister's reply, however, she will be aware of the continuing concerns among some farmers, crofters and agricultural workers exposed to organophosphates through compulsory sheep dipping and application of pesticides in the 80s and 90s. She will also be aware of the calls at Westminster for an independent inquiry on the issue, including full disclosure of any UK government documents that could shed light on how hundreds of farmers and crofters have suffered ill health over the years. 
Will she join me in backing these calls, as there are still too many unanswered questions regarding the possible links between exposure to OPs and ill health amongst the farming community? Minister. Um, yes, as a farmer's daughter, I'm well aware of the calls. Um, the issue of the impact of organophosphates on health is complicated and controversial, and I understand that there are calls for this down south. And as I've said, I'm happy to meet with the member and indeed other members who may have constituents who believe they have been ad adversely affected by organophosphates. Question number eight. In the name of Jackie Bailey, has not been lodged. The member has provided me with an explanation. Question nine. Colin Keir. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government, what improvements will be made to commuter rail services into Edinburgh as a result of awarding the franchise to Abelia, which is due to take effect from April 2015? Minister Derek McCann. The next franchise will build on existing improvements by delivering new trains, enhanced services and improved facilities. Within their bid, the Belly will recognise the need to increase train capacity throughout the country and have included plans to introduce 70 new electric trains in and out of Edinburgh, which will boost capacity by more than 20% on peak services by 2018. Colin Keir. Thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, he may be aware that many of my constituents who use Dalmeny and South Gail railway stations and who over the years have had to deal on occasions with shortened three from six carriage trains resulting in overcrowding or passengers being left at the stations as well as extremely old rolling stock being used on a regular basis. Will the Minister ensure that the Bellio are aware of these past shortcomings and ensure that they are addressed after the April takeover? Minister? Uh, yes, I will. And to assess, the Bellio is obliged to fit 30% uh, of trains with passenger counting equipment, which will allow them to monitor uh, patronage uh, levels more accurately. And this, in turn, will enable them to deliver through its uh, franchise obligations to focus capacity uh, on the, the train fleet. But generally, uh, capacity issues are focused upon, there are penalties, and we will strengthen that relationship with the operator to address any overcrowding and crowding issues that present themselves uh, in the new franchise. Elaine Smith. Thank you. President Officer, does the Minister welcome the Smith Commission's recommendations on more rail powers and would he acknowledge that postponing the decision on a Bellio could have seen improvements via the public sector and what are the prospects now for a public sector run railway in Scotland? Of course, the, 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 the Scottish Government has been consistent in having those powers. If only the Labour Party had been consistent in having those powers, then maybe we, we could have made different decisions uh, to the decisions that we have made. But we will now enter this franchise in good faith, get the best deal for Scotland and look to the future in terms of our options. We will welcome the new powers to Scotland. But if previous and successive governments had taken different choices, we could have done things completely differently. Question number 10, Annabelle Goldie. To um, ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to alleviate the planned disruption to Glasgow Edinburgh rail services in summer 2015. Minister, Derek Mackay. Uh, Network Rail are working closely with ScotRail to ensure that the route to electrification work happening between now and the introduction of the first Edinburgh to Glasgow electric services in de December 2016 is delivered with the minimum of disruption to the travelling public and that services and connections are maintained throughout. Annabelle Goldie. Presiding officer, we understand the Winchborough Tunnel has been closed between 13th June and 27th July, and trains will be diverted via Domeni. Then they'll have to reverse. Some journeys are expected to take up 50% longer, and some trains may have to be cancelled. Meantime, thousands of fans will be heading to the Open Golf Championship at St Andrews. Surely First ScotRail, as a matter of urgency, should be contemplating express services and, if appropriate, special golf excursion trains via some of the, via some of the alternative rail lines between Glasgow and Edinburgh. Minister. Well, of course, we will work very closely with everyone to try and minimise the impact on the network. But with such a major programme of investment and improvement, some disruption is inevitable. And I think that's why, working with Network Rail and others, the works will be taking place during the summer months. We'll make sure it sticks as close to time as possible and we'll work to get information out there and minimise the impact on any national event. And we will work closely with the new franchise to make sure that we can support the event, as mentioned, as best we can. This will be a massive investment overall into the line electrification and wider improvements. It will involve 
disruption. Uh, but it will be worth it, and we will do everything we can to minimise the impact on the travelling public as we improve uh, rail services right across the country. Thank you. We move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the First Minister what engagement